Hey everybody, this is Paul with What The Hell Podcast. Today's episode is very, very special, truly. I had the honor and the privilege to sit down for a two hour long interview with today's guest, Nicole Hensley Henson. Nicole has what is probably the most powerfully inspiring testimony that I have ever heard. And I'm not exaggerating. I am thankful to God that she decided to sit down with us for a few hours and to share her truly amazing story. The work that this woman is doing for the kingdom of God, unparalleled. Nicole runs a ministry full of thousands of followers called Fullness of Joy Ministry. She is a content creator for Facebook, for YouTube, among other platforms. She is a professional public speaker, a counselor, a minister, a wife, a mother, a teacher, She's a workshop leader. She is actively both teaching and practicing deliverance. And she is the author of not one, not two, but the author of three books. Just to name a few of the titles that she holds. You know, no, no, no big deal. No big deal. We've all got more than that on our plates, right? Yeah. Okay. Her testimony, it's a true example of the power of God in his ability to take over and transform lives. The ability to bring us out from utter darkness and evil of the worst kind, and not just into the light, but how he is able to transform that darkness into becoming a part of the bright, ever-shining light itself. I could not be more excited and honored to present to you our guest and my friend, Mrs. Nicole Hensley Henson. Quick warning disclaimer, and this is very, very serious. Before we get into the interview, I want to caution our listeners and viewers. The goal and the purpose of this conversation, and the goal and the purpose of Nicole sharing her testimony at all, is to praise God and to help others. I don't want anyone to get caught off guard, and I do not want to unintentionally trigger anyone who may be watching or listening. We get into some very uncomfortable and highly sensitive subjects, such as mental illness, physical abuse, even sexual abuse. And also, some of the harder truths of the Bible that can be hard for some people to swallow, including myself. However, these things are not discussed in great detail, and they are only used and presented as necessary so we can see the contrast between the dark negative and the great positive bright light that is our God. To you, our viewers, discretion is highly advised before you go any further in this video. Lastly, What The Hell Podcast, it's only possible because of our viewers and from the support of people just like you. Truly it is. We are always striving to do more and to do better for you. And all the hard work that we put into this, we want to give it away for free and we want to keep doing that. It's always going to be free for you. But if you do appreciate the hard work that we're putting in here and you'd like to become a regular monthly supporter, you can do that for just about the price of one cup of coffee per month. That's all it takes, and it's a huge help to us. You can do that by going to patreon.com slash what the hell underscore podcast. Or if you'd like to give just a one-time gift at any time, any amount, you can do so by visiting gofundme.com slash what the hell podcast. Also, I hope you're enjoying the new testimony series. And if you have a testimony that you would like to share with the world and be on the show, we are still actively accepting and reviewing all applications and requests. Just DM me personally or through the podcast on Facebook or contact the show's email address, which is paul.whatthehelltv at gmail.com. Just reach out. Just let us know that you're interested and we'll get back in contact with you as soon as possible. All those links and addresses, they will be available in the description of this video. Now, let's get to the interview. You are about to be blessed. Welcome back to What the Hell Podcast. I'm your host, Paul Harrell, and this lovely lady that I have with me today, Nicole Hensley Henson, and she has her own ministry, uh, Fullness of Joy Ministry. Is that correct? Yes. Awesome. Yeah, she's doing some really She's doing a lot of work, some really cool, very interesting things and uh, helping a lot of people in the process. She's actually already helped me out a lot and my wife as well. So you should definitely uh, check out Facebook, YouTube, right? Yes. Yeah. Fullness of Joy Ministry. And Nicole has a, a very, very interesting testimony and she is, uh, man, I don't even know the words I want to use. It's, uh, it's just been really compelling to me. She speaks a lot, whereas on the channel here, I'm usually more on the literary side of things and focusing on the academic part of the Bible. 
Nicole, she she's focused on the, the spiritual realm, the things unseen, the forces of darkness and demons and things like that in particular. And I've, I've got to tell you, like, I've been intrigued by your work. Like, I've been watching your videos and I can't stop watching them. And honestly, that whole thing, the whole, don't get me wrong, I believe in the Bible wholeheartedly, every single word. But when it comes to the that kind of thing, the darkness and the unseen realms and demons that that that's the hardest part for me to accept like I can I can understand it uh, I believe it but it's so I don't know the word I'm looking for so other to me that it's just the hardest part of the entire bible for me to grasp I've even went so far as to go out of way out of my way to kind of put it off and put it in the back of my mind and I knew at some point it would come back up to the front and need addressed. And you've actually done that for me and helped me a lot with that. That's really interesting because I think I tried to ignore it for many years of my own life. Sure. And I couldn't. Like when you're right. seeing demons walk through your house, you really can't ignore it anymore. Um, but I didn't have a box to put it in either. I, I got saved at 18, but I was not in churches that taught this stuff. Right. I, yeah, I, this is rarely talk about in church, I'm sure. I I don't know many that do. Um, right. I mean, I'm, I think it's getting more mainstream now than definitely years ago. And when I'm 45, so when I was 18, none of my circles talked about this kind of thing. So yeah. I never knew what to do with it. It was one of those things you just try to ignore and, and hope it goes away. And it doesn't. Right. right. Yeah, I mean, especially when you're having personal encounters and experiences with it. Yeah. It's, I'd say it's kind of hard to ignore that. Absolutely. Yeah, there, there is no ignoring it. So you try to just get to the place where you're like, don't know what to do about it. So just going to live my life the best I can. Right, right. Well, it's just, it's really amazing. And I'm really, uh, it's just inspiring to hear your story. And uh, you've honestly, like I said, you've helped me a lot. And uh, I appreciate all the work you're doing. Thank truly, you. Truly. God told me early on that most of what I was going to be doing was being one, very transparent about my own life. Yeah. I, I, that's, one thing I, that's one thing I really appreciated about you. Oh, and I wanted to say, speaking of which, I, on a couple of your videos, uh, you had said, uh, because you're live on Facebook and stuff a lot of times. So like you were, you said you were being careful with a lot of your words and the way you said things and so on, which I completely get, especially being live. But uh, I just want to let you know, like you are, I'm not worried about any of it. I'm as be comfortable. However you want to deliver it, that's totally fine with me. As raw and real as you want to get, I am open and welcome to that. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah. What I find on Facebook is there's certain words that get your videos flagged really. Uh -huh. I had some taken down, like I'd spent time preparing them, delivering them, and then they just get flagged and taken down. So I've started being more careful in there because of that. And it's... It's kind of a bummer. Yeah, it really is. It's kind of a shame. But yeah, anyways, uh, if you don't mind, I'd just like to ask like maybe a couple personal questions and have everybody get to know you a little bit better. Absolutely. So uh, you said you you got saved at age 18? Yes. Awesome. So you didn't grow up in the church or have any uh, childhood experience with it or anything like that? I did. My, my grandparents were Christians. And so I spent, my mom was a single mom off and on. Um, she had three different marriages. And so if she wasn't married, a lot of times we were living with my grandparents, just being a single mom was so difficult. And they always went to church. They went to old time Pentecostal church, little okay. small church. And so I did grow up around that, but my mom wasn't saved. And so I never, I just never took that step. I, I knew about God. I feared God, I knew about sin, and I wasn't ready to surrender my life. So it wasn't until I was 18 that I decided it was time for me to get saved. Well, that's great. I'm, I'm glad you I'm glad you did. But yeah, the Pentecostal background, that kind of uh, that kind of correlates with what you got going on here. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, that's cool. Um, so Udiana or you lived there for a time? I lived there my whole life until 2012. In 2012, my my mom and dad and brother, my husband, me, and my son moved to Arizona. We stayed there until 2021, and now we're in Texas. Awesome. What part of Texas? 
We're about 30 minutes south of Dallas. We're in a really small town. Nobody ever recognizes. It's called Ennis, but it's super tiny. Everybody okay. recognizes Dallas. Yeah, it's kind of crazy, like I mentioned to you in our uh, text messages, but uh, I'm in Indiana here in central Indiana and born and raised. And the only other two places I have ever lived other than here is for a short time. I lived in Texas, just outside of Dallas. That is funny. Yeah, it's kind of crazy. And so we were kind of torn between going to Tennessee or going to, to Texas. And we had visited my son. And when we crossed the state line, I heard the Lord speak to my heart and say, welcome home. And I'm like, I think we're going to be going to Texas. And I didn't say anything because my husband loved Arizona. And so I'm like, Lord, I don't want to be the one to say, I think we're supposed to move. I don't want to take that from him. Will you please tell him? And it was within just a matter of days. He's like, I think we should move to Texas. So here we are. <laughs> wow, that's great. I, I just got to ask since the, the Texas thing, I know there's been a whole lot of big important things going on down in Texas recently that I'm sure like everybody is somewhat familiar with. Uh, I guess it's kind of calmed down the last week or so, but is there anything being a local down there that maybe a outsider might not understand or know about that's going on? Are, are you talking about the border crisis? Yeah. 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 Uh, everything that I've seen, I've saw online in our town. I have not heard or seen anything going on here because I uh, thought, Ooh, it, it may start getting a little tense. It's yeah. not at all. Um, even in the, the surrounding towns where we're at, of course, I'm pretty far from the border. So right. maybe in those towns, it's a lot more intense, but here, no. Okay. Which is really interesting because I wondered how how it would be. Yeah, that is interesting. I was I've been really curious. Yeah, because mm -hmm. uh, you you never know like with media and stuff like what's actually what what they're actually releasing, what's actually happening. You know, like even in our local town groups and stuff on Facebook, nobody's talking about it really. Huh. There's just not there. There's really it's really quiet, which I thought was a little odd. So I don't know if things are getting censored, which. Could be possible. Right. Or if it's just not a big, I don't want to say not a big deal, but if it's just not like as big of a deal where we're at because we're so far removed from it. But I am seeing on, not locally, but on others, other social media sites where they're talking more about it. Huh, that's that's interesting. So it kind of seems like it's uh, it kind of uh, the atmosphere of it seems the same for you there as it does here because it seemed yeah. like it was building and building and there was tension and then the last week or so it's just kind of dissipated and calmed way down. I was just curious. All right, I'd just like to say before Nicole gets into her testimony that anytime anyone shares a testimony that it's a very brave and courageous thing to do. It really is. There's really nothing that you can possess that is more personal to you and more unique to you. And it's just a really brave thing to do. And uh, it's something that deserves our respect and our attention and our support. And this lady has a very, very interesting and very powerful testimony. And I'm, I'm so excited to have her on the show. With that, Nicole, whenever you're ready, wherever you'd like to start, I'm all ears. All right. Well, I do like to usually start by saying that I am very aware of triggers and very aware that people listening may have went through trauma themselves and they may be at different places in their journey to healing. And when I share my testimony, I take that very seriously. And so I want you to rest assured that you can listen and I will do my utmost to not create any trauma for any listener. Um I will be talking about sexual abuse, but I don't go into detail. So you don't have to worry about that. You don't have to be afraid of that. So please stay tuned and continue listening because it does get good. The ending is way better than the beginning. <laughs> it is. You've heard it. So yeah. I you have, yes. Have, yeah. So, so there, there is good at the end. Um, I usually just start at the beginning because I feel like you can't get a full picture unless that's where I start. And I was born into a family of domestic violence. My biological dad was very, very violent toward my mom. He was not the type of abuser that was like charismatic and loving and kind and then would just turn. He, he was very narcissistic, very controlling, manipulating, dominating, and all of those things. So we, I learned pretty much probably from birth to tiptoe around him, that life revolved around him. I can even remember we lived in Florida when I was little 
And one of my earliest memories of him was him taking my toys and taking the squeaky part out of my toys because it, it just, he didn't want to be interrupted watching television or whatever he was doing. My mom stayed with him until I was about three years old and then she left him. I think she just had had all she could take. And when she left, her family lived in Indiana and his family was in Florida and they had moved to where his family, his mom and dad was. And so she took me and went back to Indiana. And in the divorce, he was granted visitation every summer and every other Christmas. And so I started visiting him by myself. And I, you know, I, I don't have clear memories of the first few visits at all. Um, I don't even know what that was like. I assume he lived with his parents at the time, but I don't even remember that part. When my memories really start kicking in or when I was around seven, I visited him and he was with a new woman and they were actually going to be getting married that summer. And I knew right away things were different. And I didn't know how to file this away in my brain because I'd never been exposed to the occult. I'd never been exposed to witchcraft, Satanism, none of those things. But he was already heavily involved when I got there that summer. I don't know who introduced who. I don't know if she introduced him, but she was a self-proclaimed witch. So I'm assuming she introduced him, but they got really deep into it together. Wow. There was... Um, I, I remember him making crystals, necklaces, and he would say he got his power from them. Um, they had wizards hanging up in the house. Like that was their decor, dragons, wizards. And that was new. He didn't used to have, before that, he didn't have that that type of thing. He was always into fantasy. He loved like sci-fi and fantasy, but this was taking it to the extreme. He also said that he had powers to heal, um, not from God. He made that obvious that they weren't from God. And that he was a dark prophet. Um, there was just a lot of things that I, I just absolutely did not understand. There was there was animal sacrifices. That's when I really remember the sexual abuse starting with him and his wife. And um, it was it was a constant in their home. And he would choose between me and I had two stepsisters. And I had a stepbrother, but he physically abused him. He didn't sexually abuse him that I know of. The sexual abuse was with me and his and my step siblings. You know, the, the, the sexual abuse was traumatizing, but I think the more traumatizing thing was him telling me that he could read my mind. Wow. Told me, yeah, like that for a kid. And, and then you're watching your parent do all these things that look magical. They look powerful. They look like this person has control. They're killing animals and draining their blood and using them for, for rituals. And so when they tell you they can read your mind, you believe it. Like I believed it. And I can remember being back in Indiana with my mom's family and thinking, don't think bad, don't think bad. Like I couldn't even think bad thoughts about him. So he controlled me from the time I was seven for years. And it wasn't just that I couldn't tell about the abuse. I couldn't even think bad thoughts about him. Right. So I was constantly, I started counting. That's where OCD first was birthed. I started counting everything, objects, numbers, letters, all constant counting over and over and over in my mind to block out any bad thoughts about him, block out memories, never even considered telling, never, it never crossed my mind. Oh, I needed to tell because he, he told me from early on that if I told he would kill my mom and me. And, and I believe and Meanwhile, you're, you're thinking that if you even think about it, he would know. And he would kill us. Oh, wow. Absolutely. And he wow. would kill you. So imagine never having a safe space. That's how I felt. Yeah. It wasn't even just the memories of the trauma. It was thinking that I had eyes on me at all times. And that was the other thing that I can remember early on. I always felt like there were real eyes looking at me. Like I would see them in the closets. I would see them in dark spaces. Like there was eyes on me all the time. I felt like I was always being watched. I felt like there was something always like right behind me, breathing down my neck, like pow like real person. And I could never get away from that. And so that was kind of how it started with the abuse. He stayed married to her for about three years. And then um, he left her and he ended up back in Indiana because his mom and dad moved to Indiana. So we were all back in Indiana together in the same town. My life as a teenager was pretty intense because of the abuse. I made a lot of poor choices. I started hanging out with I went straight from being interested in guys to being interested in men. When I was like 14, I was chasing men that was 24, 25 and getting their attention, which 
looking back, I should have never got their attention, but I did. At the time, I would have said, oh, I was in a relationship with them. And I, I felt that way until my son turned the age I was when I was getting the attention of these grown men. And no longer did I look at it like I was in relationships. Then I realized, oh, wait, they should have never been interested in me. And that was more abuse. That was that was actually going on in my life. I also, I did not get heavy into drugs. Thank the Lord. I know he was protecting me from that because I had the type of personality. If I tried something one time, I wanted it all the time. I just didn't have access. Like I smoke a little pot here and there, but I just didn't have access to it. Um, it's not like it is nowadays. I don't, I mean, I, I know it was around, but we lived in a very rural small town. I just didn't know how to get access to it. Right. I drank some, but again, I, I didn't have a lot of access to it. I also have very low self-esteem. I missed a ton of school because I couldn't attend school in the days when there was book reports or oral reports. I would say that I was sick and I couldn't go and, and I was sick a lot. I spent a lot of time just sick. I had unexplained stomach aches, headaches. I had allergies. I was just a chronically sick kid from the time I was seven. It's when it started. And I was on allergy shots and I would go to the doctor over and over and over. And I just was like a frail child. I see pictures of myself and I just looked frail. I got sick so easily and I was always just nervous and anxious. I don't ever remember being a time when I was just a carefree kid where I didn't have any worries. Like I, I think I was born with worries is what it felt like. And so life continued like that. You know, through my teen years, I started cutting um, got more and more depressed. The first time I had suicidal ideation, I think was around the age of 12. My biological dad shot himself through the, his chin. He said he was trying to commit suicide, but it did not even enter into his brain. It stopped at his uh, skull. It traveled through his sinuses and stopped at his skull. Wow. When he did that, my whole world turned upside down because I knew for a fact if he could hurt himself, he could kill me easily because he was his favorite person in life. So I became very suicidal. I became very anxious, nervous, scared. My family, my mom and dad, stepdad. Let me, let me say this real quick. When you hear me talk about my abuser, I will always say biological dad. When you hear me say dad, that's my stepdad, but he's been my dad since I was 12. Okay. And so I don't want to make any confusion there. Not the person who abused me. Got so, it. Understood. So my, my mom and dad, they got me into therapy for the first time and I disclosed the abuse and she did not report it, which I don't know why. Looking back now, she was a mandated reporter and it did not get reported. She did send a letter to my dad, my biological dad, saying that I needed a break from him. And that was about all that was said. And so I did go for a, a period of time where I wasn't visiting him. But then I got so afraid because I would just be sitting in my room wondering, is he going to break in? Is he going to kill me because I'm supposed to act like there's nothing wrong? Is he going to send somebody else to kill me? And so I would always end up having visitation with him again because I was so scared of him. And, and even though I disclosed abuse to the therapist, she didn't disclose it to my mom. So my mom still didn't know what was going on. They thought maybe I was on drugs. They thought maybe um, I was losing my mind because what they saw was a teenager out of control. There was times that I would just claw my face and scratch it. I would cut glass and cut my arms with it. I was completely and totally out of control in a lot of ways. I refused to go to school. I refused to do much of anything. I was emotionally up and down and everywhere. I also developed an eating disorder. I was anorexic. I was screaming for help, um, but nobody knew, knew what I was screaming or what I was saying. And nobody, none of the grownups in my life knew how to handle aggression that I was showing uh, just because they didn't know what was going on. I also was very, very depressed. I could sleep for two days in a row and maybe wake up for a couple hours in the whole two days. And I would basically put myself to sleep. If I didn't want to face something, that was my coping. I would just go to bed and just sleep and sleep and sleep. I did that a lot. I slept a lot of hours and a lot of time, but I was horribly afraid of the dark. Super, super afraid. From the time I can remember, I could not sleep alone. There were many times I would go climb into my mom and dad's bedroom. I was going to say bed. It wasn't their bed, their bedroom. And I would sleep on the floor because I was so afraid at nighttime. As soon as the sun started going down, I would get like sweats. Like I would be so scared that I would be sweating profusely because the the terror I would also have weird things happen. Like as a teenager, I would go to sleep with jewelry on like a ring or a necklace and I would wake up and it would be gone. And then maybe the next day it would be sitting on top of my dresser or um, 
I would sometimes hear clawing marks on my wall, like on the inside of my wall. I would hear somebody walk up my steps to my bedroom and come and stand beside my bed. And I would turn around thinking it was my mom and nobody would be there. I would have something chase me down my, my stairs from my bedroom. And so I was scared to be alone. I was scared to sleep at night. And it, it was it was it was super difficult. And then that made it more difficult to go to school because when you're not sleeping at all during the night, like I couldn't go to sleep till the sun started coming up. Well, then it was time to get ready for school. And, and that wasn't happening. So when I was 16, I met a guy that was close to my own age. He was 18 at the time. And we decided to get married, like right after we met. What what better thing to do? Get married. <laughs> In my family, though, it wasn't that unusual. The women all got young, I got married young. They all got married before the age of 18. So I think my grandma was like 15. My mom was, I think, 17. I don't know. My aunts, my cousins, all of us, we were super young. So it wasn't that odd for us because it was never on our radar. Oh, you could go to school, you could go to college, you could have a career. Like we, we all we knew was get married, have babies and start a family. Like that, yeah. That's what you did. My family's from Kentucky and they migrated to Indiana. And I just think it was a cultural thing where we just all got married young. There was nothing else that you did with life. Might as well get started. So sure. I did. And within, I don't know, I can't even remember, within weeks, he hit me for the first time. And there was a lot of violence in that marriage. We both were very, very broken. And we brought that brokenness into our marriage. And it got very violent. But I never even considered telling anyone because I had already been trained by my dad that you don't tell by my biological dad. You know, you don't tell anybody. You just, you cover it up. People who love you hurt you and you cover it up. You make excuses and love hurts. And that's just what it is. And so we were married for a little bit and then I got pregnant. And right before I turned 18, the month before I turned 18, we had our son. And then my mom and dad, in the meantime, had got saved. They started going to church. They got involved in their church. They got saved. They turned their lives completely and totally around. They were really serving God on fire for him. And they would invite us all the time. And I, I, I didn't want to go. He didn't want to go. But then I was at the point where I knew if something didn't change, I wasn't going to be able to stay in that marriage. I, I didn't even know if I was going to be able to live because everything was painful. Life was painful. The marriage was painful. Everything just was painful. And so we accepted an invitation to go. I think it was like a marriage retreat type thing at their church. And we met with the pastor in his office and he led us through the plan of salvation. And we both accepted the Lord as our, you know, that accepted Jesus as our Lord and Savior. Praise and Lord. yeah, I mean, it was, I was 18. I, I was young. It feels like young at the at the time. I didn't. You know, you're 18. You know it all. Looking back, I was a baby. Um, so we got saved, and we immediately got got deep into the church. We was a type of church. We had Sunday school, Sunday morning service, Sunday night service, Wednesday night Bible study, and then a lot of times during the week we had other get-togethers, just fellowship and Bible studies and all kinds of. We were very very involved, and so we got immersed into the church culture really quickly. In a lot of ways, I grew. In my relationship with God. Um, but then there were other things that just didn't get better. I thought that once I got saved, I would not be depressed anymore. I thought I would be happy. I thought I would be whole. I thought I would be healed. And that just did not happen immediately. And I, I thought it would. And a lot of things were better. Like I'm not minimizing my relationship with God uh -huh. and he's faithful and he's amazing in every, every way possible. I just didn't know how to heal and I didn't know how to get freedom. And so I was growing in reading the word and understanding it because I was going to so many Bible studies and, and I had a community, but on the inside, I still felt like I was dying. I fought suicidal ideation all the time. I was depressed. I was lonely. I felt isolated. I never felt like I fit in. If you were watching from the outside, you would say, wow, she has a lot of friends and she's really the life of the party and outgoing. But on the inside, I felt like I never fit in. I was never part of the, the in group. And it wasn't them making me feel that way. It was me feeling that way. I always felt like that people didn't really know me. And if they did, they wouldn't like me. And that I just had to plaster a smile on my face and act like life was great. Right. I get it. Yeah. Like it, it, there just wasn't like there weren't conversations of, you know, oh, I'm dealing with depression. And then you felt like you could jump in and say, oh, me too. It just wasn't like that. We met all the time as, as a community and a church community, but we just didn't talk about things like that. Right. I think everybody probably looking back now, there was probably so many people dealing with things and we just never talked about it. If one person had a said, hey, you know what I'm dealing with? Probably 10 other people would have said me too. 
but it just was not like that. And I, I don't know why. I think that that is one of the things about church that needs to change. We 100% do, agree. Yeah. I mean, we need to break the stigma where we can't talk about what's going on. Being a Christian is hard. Living this Christian life is hard. And to pretend otherwise is just failing people. And, Absolutely. And it is very hard. Yeah. I mean, it's <laughs> not easy. And to pretend like life is just great sets new Christians up for failure because then they wonder, well, why isn't my life great? Right. But you realize, oh, they've been in it for 20 years and their life isn't that great either. They've just been taught to put the smile on too. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I've had uh, my own similar experience with things like that first getting into the church years ago. And uh, yeah, it kind of, it was confusing and it, luckily it didn't detour me or anything. And I was able to work it out and just kind of figure out the dynamics of everything on my own. But for other people, it worries me because yeah. it can very easily hinder someone's faith and their relationship with the church and church is vitally important. But yeah, I think that is a huge flaw the church has. And I think for me, I turned it inward and said, there must be something innately wrong with me because oh, man, I'm yeah. living a victorious life. Yeah. Yeah. And I internalized it. And then I internalized the lie that, God must be answering their prayers, but he's not answering mine. Oh, so there's man. something wrong with me. Yeah. See, that's worrisome. I live with that lie. Well, since I was 18 until my, my late thirties, I lived with that wow. lie for a very long time and it didn't get solidified right at first. It was sneaky. You know how the enemy is just very sneaky and the lie got planted. And as the years went by and I didn't get healed, that's when it got solidified. So at first it was just like, the enemy whispering, why did God let that stuff happen to you? If he's a good God, why did you even go through it? Why is life so hard? Why are you so depressed? Why aren't you better? And then as the years went by, it's like I, I really started questioning and wondering, you know, why do we go through such hard things? And I'll talk about that in a, in a minute um, because that was a very huge turning point in my life when I let that go. Oh, so sure. anyway, it was huge. Uh, so I... I Stayed in the marriage that I was in for about six years. He was in and out of the church. Every time he got out, he got worse. When he was in the church, he would do somewhat better, but he felt like it was too hard to try to live a biblical life. It wasn't for him. And then he would be out and then he would be back in. It was, it was very difficult. And the violence just never stopped. The last time that he exploded, it was bad. He actually put part of my body through a wall. And wow. I was like, I, I was bruised so bad I could barely walk. And I saw my five-year-old, the look on his face, and I knew I couldn't do it anymore. It wasn't just about me. It wasn't about, because like when my son was a baby, you know, it didn't, I don't want to say it didn't affect him because, you know, there's studies that talk about how domestic violence does affect children. But as a baby, I didn't see it affecting him. As a five-year-old, there's no hiding that he's seeing me get beat and he's crying and I'm, I, I just couldn't do it anymore. And so I left and moved back in with my parents, but I also was very codependent. That had not gotten better. And so I did not want to be alone. I knew that as soon as I left and got divorced, I was going to want to be married. I, I didn't want to do life by myself. I was in my early twenties. And so I started dating again and I got married within months of getting divorced, not even a year. It was in, it was within months, but thankfully this, this, the man that I married to, we've been married 20 plus years. He's an amazing man of God. We both right. have healed a lot. He was very broken when we got married. He was not violent ever, ever, but he was broken in his own, in, in his own areas. And God has really restored both of us along the same journey at the same time. So once we got married, you know, everybody thought, okay, now she'll feel safe because then I disclosed all of the domestic violence. I had hid it for all the years. Nobody knew. I had disclosed all of that. I disclosed about the, the sexual abuse. Everything was out. And so everybody, like in my family, thought, okay, now she'll be set. And I wasn't. I actually got worse after I moved in with my husband. We got married. I moved in because I think for the first time in years, I was in a safe place. And I didn't know what to do with that. I was used to chaos. I was used to torment. I was used to trauma. I didn't know what to do with stability. It felt weird. I didn't know what, to, I, I didn't know how to act with it. And also becoming, coming to a safe place. It was like I hit a brick wall because I was no longer in the fight or flight every single day. Like I was in, in the previous marriage that being in the fight and flight kept me in a place where I was only dealing with what I had to deal with. When I was in the new safe marriage, everything just whoosh, everything came in. 
I got severely more severely depressed. Uh, clinical depression was really bad, more suicidal ideation. I also started having times where I would slip into like other personalities. And what I mean by that is there was times my husband would come home and I would be rocking on the floor crying for mommy. There would be times that he would come home and I would be hiding in the closet because I was scared to come out. I would be underneath our bed and I wouldn't want to come out from underneath the bed. We would go out to the store and all of a sudden it was like, I would just feel like everybody was looking at me and I would get extreme paranoia and we would just have to leave. Sometimes we'd just leave our cart just sitting there and because I couldn't handle being in the store. Um, he also started experiencing things he'd never experienced. So by this time I had all right, I mean, I, I was used to, I don't know if used to get, I don't know if that's the right word. Cause I don't know if you ever get used to this, right. but I had spent years seeing things like shadows walking through my house. Sometimes I would see full blown people. I remember one time I was laying in bed and I saw what looked like somebody that had on an Abraham Lincoln outfit, walk across my bed and walk out my window. I seen a woman in a white wedding dress one time. Like I, I seen people and I seen shadows pretty much daily. I would hear things, see things, feel things. There were times at night, my bed would shake all night long. Like it, like somebody was standing there shaking it all night long. Um, that was not unusual for me. I would hear voices. I would hear voices in my head that were not mine. And I would also hear voices like audibly in, in my home. And then my husband started experiencing those same things. And he's like, I have never experienced anything like this. What is going on? He was in the bathroom one time and the shower curtain opened all the way by itself. And Another time he had let our dogs out and he knows he closed the door and the door got opened so that they could come back in. And he started seeing shadow people walk through the house and he's like, I've never experienced this. Like what is going on? And I, I, the only thing my family and I could come up with is because I have been exposed to the occult at such a young age, I was just like a magnet for demons. Like that's, that's the only explanation we had, but we didn't know what to do with it. We knew it, but we didn't know how to fix it. There were times like I would be driving to church and I would feel somebody sitting in the back seat kicking me. Like, I mean, I would literally be bumping up. It would be kicking so hard. I would wake up with scratches, bite marks. Um, sometimes I woke up with bruises that were handprints, but were obviously not my handprints. Um, lots of things like that. Lights turning on, off and on. Lots and lots of torment in that way. But my husband and I also loved horror movies. Watched them all the time. Love the newest releases. Couldn't wait for October so we could watch them all month long. Never once connecting that we were letting a spirit of fear just run rampant in our home because of all the doors we were opening ourselves. So that went on for several years. I continued to decline more and more and more. I went to school to become a mental health therapist because I thought I could help people and I wanted to help people. And I learned how to cope with my own symptoms, which didn't help much. And I was trying to help other people cope with theirs. But in the midst of that, I went back to therapy for myself and I got diagnosed with clinical depression, PTSD and DID. And the idea behind DID is that as a small child, whenever you go through, well, especially as a small child, when you go through trauma, you can split into different personalities and all of those personalities can be living in the same body. And it made complete and total sense to me because I had just went to school for all of this stuff. And so I'm like, yeah, that makes sense because I knew I'd heard voices. I'd always heard voices. I knew their personalities. I knew who they were. And part of the the treatment is to, to integrate and coexist with each other. So you let them have leeway in your life. You let them speak through you. You let them um, create through you. So I I was letting them write. I was letting them draw. I was letting them them talk. And I was trying to cohabitate with them. The problem was they hated everybody. They hated God. They hated my husband. They hated my child. They hated my parents. They, they presented it as they just wanted to keep me safe. And all these other people were just out to get me and they were out to hurt me. But then they would also try to get me to kill myself because they would say that life would be better. My family would be better. And it was just a constant chatter. I can remember if I wanted to read a book or something, I would have to turn the television on just to drown out the noise in my head. That went on for many years. We moved to Arizona. When we moved to Arizona, God told my stepdad that I was going to be healed in the desert. And we didn't, we had no idea what that meant. We had no idea where, when, how. I physically was getting much sicker too. I started being seen at the Mayo Clinic. I had some breathing issues that they couldn't figure out, stomach issues, um, some autoimmune diseases. So um, I was, I was obese. I was close to 300 pounds, but I was um, malnourished because my body wouldn't accept any type of nutrition. I'm trying to think of some of the other things. I had so many things thrown at me. I can't even remember them all. 
And in around 2019, my son had messaged me and he said, Mom, I think that you need to listen to this minister. I said, okay. So I listened to it and it was talking about deliverance ministry. One, I had never heard the word, didn't even know what that meant. And he was also talking about spiritual warfare and how as Christians, we can also have the need to close the doors to demons and have them verbally cast out in the name of Jesus. And I'm like, that's me. Something clicked in my spirit. The first, I, they didn't have to convince me. I was listening five minutes and I'm like, that's me. I just, it, it bared witness to my spirit and I just knew it. And so I messaged that pastor and I said, do you have any resources? Because I knew absolutely nothing. He he gave me a few books to buy, or he told me to buy a few books. I did. And then I set them aside. Um, I don't even, I don't know why, because I was so excited. And then I just sat them down. In the meantime, I had a friend who did prayer ministry and I started meeting with her some and we would pray together. And one of the things that whenever we prayed together, the Lord showed me that I did not trust him. And this goes back to the walls that I was talking about that was created by those lies. So I had a vision because sometimes the Lord gives me visions. And I saw myself sitting in the car and I knew that represented like my life. And I was in the driver's seat and I thought, oh, I've put him in the passenger seat. And I look over and he's not even in the car. He's standing outside the car and I got the windows up and the doors locked. And I'm like, I guess I don't trust you at all. And so we worked through trusting, but I got sicker and sicker. And I couldn't see her anymore. And so I lost about a year there. And I don't really even know what happened in that year other than I was super sick. I developed this strange thing that if I talked more than like three words in a sentence, I would start coughing. I was seen by three different specialists. That's how I ended up at the Mayo Clinic. And they could not get this cough under control. So I literally could not have conversations. I couldn't talk on the phone. I couldn't talk in person. And it would just come out of the blue. Sometimes I would be okay. Other times I couldn't even talk at all because I would just start coughing. So the Lord then laid on my heart to set aside about a week for prayer and fasting for healing. At this time in my life, when I would go to bed at night, I really didn't know if I was going to wake up the next morning. I thought I was going to, like, I really thought that my life could be over. Like, I was severely obese. I had all these health issues. Now I had this cough. I was on breathing treatments. I was on inhalers. The doctors couldn't figure it out. I'm like, the Mayo Clinic can't even figure it out. I had put a lot of hope and trust in doctors at this point in my life because I had kind of, not that I gave up on God, but I felt like that this had went on for years and he had not healed me. So maybe he wasn't going to, I always knew he could, but I didn't know if he would. So I started putting a lot of hope and trust in doctors and, um, I probably made them an idol in my life in a lot of ways because I always thought they're going to figure it out. They're going to fix it. They're going to do this. And so at that point, I was just very, very sick physically, emotionally, mentally. The the PTSD, I had triggers that were sounds, sights, smells, voices, uh, body type, clothes, you name it. I had hundreds of them. Wow. They controlled mine and my husband's life. And I was a very bitter, nasty, ugly, hateful person. I was so bitter because I had been sick for so long and I was, I was over it and I was tired and I, and I was wrapped in pity and, and self-absorption because I just wanted to be better. But because of that, I, I let it turn me into somebody I was never created to be. So when I set aside that week for prayer and fasting, the Lord also said, have your parents come over a specific day during that week. And I was like, oh, Lord, I don't want to call them and ask them. They live like almost two hours away. Will you call them and ask them? You know, I didn't feel worthy. I didn't feel like I could even ask my parents to come two hours to pray for me. Hour and a half. I can't remember how far it was. And so it was just a few minutes later, my mom messages me and she says, Nicole, I feel like God is saying we need to come pray for you. <laughs> yes. Thank you, Lord. Yes. So in, in that week of preparation, God did a few things. One was he told me to stop consuming sugar. I had been highly, highly addicted to sugar. And I don't use that word lightly and I don't use it flippantly, the addiction. It was, it was truly an addiction. And I um, couldn't sleep if there was sugar in the house. And I'm talking like candy pop ice cream, anything. Like I would eat a whole half gallon of ice cream with a half a cake and think nothing about it, not even blink an eye. I was drinking like two 44 ounces of, of soda a day. Um, the grocery store, not the grocery store, the gas station was my my drug house because I would go there and I would get so much sugar. And again, I don't say that lightly and I'm not being funny. I'm serious. I had yeah. way, way too much. And so he told me to do that. And I'm like, oh Lord, I don't even know if I can, but I wrote it down on a piece of paper so that I could see it every day. And so I stopped consuming sugar, cold turkey. And then he started walking me through 
trusting him more. And he had given me a scripture, trust in the Lord with all your heart, lean not on your own understanding and all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. He had given me that scripture years prior. And I had even, I was so proud that that was my life verse, but I wasn't living it. I was leaning on my own understanding because I kept telling God, I just need to know why. Why did I go through the abuse? If you would just tell me that, then I can let it go. And what he brought me to that week was, was a crossroads. And he, he was showing me that I could continue holding on to that with a death grip, or I could really release it and lay it down and walk down the path of healing. And so I, I released that. I laid it down at his feet. And I knew that meant I would never bring it up again. I would never again question him why that had to happen, why it did happen, or you know why people walk through the things they walk through. It meant having faith and trust in him, regardless of what the situation looks like. He also taught me to look at him through the lens of his word and not the lens of the abuse because I had that backwards. I was viewing him and his character through the lens of the abuse versus who he is based on his word. And he also led me through repentance. So he started showing me all the ways in my own life that I had opened the doors to demons. And there was a lot not only with things that had been done to me, but how I had treated other people and the way that I had allowed lies of the enemy to shape my life. And so I spent those days in deep, deep prayer, pretty much around the clock. Like I slept at night, but I, I was in a lot of prayer. The night before my parents came, I was praying and I felt something start choking me. And it was different than what I had felt prior with, with the breathing issues. It just felt like I was being choked. And I knew it was the enemy. I knew it was demons. And so I told him, you may choke me, you may kill me, but you're going to do it while I'm praising the Lord. And I just started singing and praising the Lord and it, it lifted immediately. Then I was able to get some rest. Well, then my parents came the next day. And as soon as they walked in the door, I immediately wanted to physically attack my dad. Now, I have never felt anything bad toward my stepdad. He has been my dad from day one that they got married. He has been an amazing man. I respect him. I think he's one of the smartest men I've ever met in my life. But as soon as he walked in, I physically felt revulsion against him. I wanted to attack him. I had to sit on my hands because I wanted to claw his eyes out. We immediately started praying. And after four and a half hours, there was about 45 to 60 demons that were cast out of my body. Oh, Going wow. into this, I had no idea if maybe I would have one, maybe I'd have two, and then I would have some mental illness left over that we'd have to deal with. Like, I did not know going in what was what, you know, like maybe oh, yeah. I had some altars and some demons. When we, we got done, I had zero mental illness, like not even one symptom. All of it was gone. There was no alters. There were only demons. There was no depression. There was no, not even PTSD. I've not had one symptom since May 24th, 2024. And so in my case, it was 100% demonic torment. So the Lord told me, I gave you the blueprint to get free. Now go help other people get free. And I was like, oh. Okay, Lord, I didn't even know what that was going to look like. But right. then the next step was share your testimony. I said, okay. So I went live on Facebook and I did it about one o'clock in the morning because I didn't want anybody to ask me any questions. That was my whole thing. Like I'll share Lord, but I don't want nobody to ask me questions. So I hit the live button <laughs> live. I shared it. It went, it, it blew up fast. Wow. And people started reaching out to me from literally all over the world saying, I need what you found. And so I started taking people through the same process that I had went through. And then I wrote up a, um, a, a, like a worksheet for people to work on before we met, just with the things the Lord had walked me through. That eventually developed into a book, another book, then a testimony book. And now I'm at a place where I'm not doing one-on-one -on -one meetings with people. I'm doing more of teaching. I'm doing a lot of teaching. I do workshops. I do YouTube videos writing more books. I'm trying to launch some e-courses so people can just go on and take those whenever they want. And that's where I'm at now. That's a big old long story, but that that's me. <laughs> it, it's been an amazing, amazing few years. I can tell you it. You've been busy. <laughs> yes. Very busy. And just to go back and visit, like he had me write my whole testimony in a book and going back, looking at who I was, 
it's like night and day. The people that knew me, like I had hardly any relationship with my son. I had destroyed all of that. I was emotionally abusive towards him because I was always the victim and I was manipulating and controlling and full of pity and, and victimhood mentality. But God has completely restored that. We, we live in the same area that they live in. They're getting ready to have a baby, him and his wife, and I get to be part of their life. And so not only has God been working in the ministry, he's been restoring my relationships, my marriage. Oh my goodness. It we look at each other sometimes and we're like, wow. I mean, we don't even know what to say because my husband also went through deliverance. It wasn't just me. He went through about five weeks after I did, if that, four or five weeks after me. And so God has had us on the exact same path of healing at the same time. And it's just been an amazing thing. Wow. That, that is beautiful. Yeah. So it, it has been, um, it's been really good. You know, there's been a lot of spiritual warfare around it. I, I don't want to make it like once you go through that type of situation that your life is just, you know, free sailing and that nothing ever comes against you again. And no, the enemy still fights. He still tries to come in. Right after I went through deliverance, my parents had to move away. They, they moved to a different state because COVID had hit and my dad lost his job. And I remember plainly, I was sitting on the couch and I heard the enemy say, what if you get depression again because you're here by yourself? And then I heard the Lord speak to me and say, you didn't have depression. You had a demon and that demon is gone. So I learned very quickly, oh, wait, that means they're going to try to come back and they're going to try to convince me that I didn't get free from none of that stuff. Or they're going to try to convince me that I can get it again. And so he taught me early on to be on guard against that. But we are surrounded by spiritual warfare all the time. And if we don't know how to fight it, we could spend a lifetime getting beat up by it. And that doesn't that doesn't end, in my opinion, till we step into heaven. I don't think warfare ends until we get there. Oh, sure. Yeah. Until we get there, I definitely uh, concur. I don't I don't think that's something that ever ends until, like you said, till we get there. No. No, and I think the hard part is when you come up in churches that don't teach, and I'm not knocking churches, they don't teach it because they don't know. Right. And I'm not blaming them. They don't know and they can't teach what they don't know. But then we as believers are not equipped for the battle. And when you're not equipped for the battle, you're not you're not going to be victorious. It's like going into a boxing ring with no gloves, no mouthpiece, no headpiece. You just stand there, you're getting beat up over and over and over. That's what happens when we're not taught these things and when we don't talk about them. Right. Absolutely. It, it's definitely something that should be talked about and taught a lot more. Like I said, I ha I've had my personal struggles with just uh, accepting this and understanding these types of things. And that's mainly due to the fact that I've never had anyone really dive into it or to talk about it with until more more recently and uh that whole world has kind of opened up to me like i said used to re reading the bible i'd be reading the gospel and jesus is casting out demons and stuff I'll, I'll go really deep into everything else but when something like that comes up i'm like oh turn the pay okay we'll just skim <laughs> right over that I, 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 that's uh something other i don't get it but we'll let jesus handle that but no that's something uh obviously that uh he put emphasis on and was very important. Yeah, if we think about it, you know, really it was one third of his ministry. Yeah. Like his ministry was casting out demons, healing the sick, and preaching the good news. It was right. one third of what he did. Right. It, it really is so vitally important. And uh, he's to be our example for everything. And that was a huge part of his ministry. But, you know, I, I understand that completely. Though here I am, think about this, 45 to 60 demons inside me. And I read that in the Bible and I'm just like, it, it never even, it never even crossed my mind that I might need that. Right. It, it wasn't even on my radar. Absolutely. I could read that a hundred times and it would have been like, wow, that's great for them. But it, it, it never was like, oh, wait a minute, that's me too. <laughs> right. My husband says one time. Years ago, he asked me, do you think any of what you're dealing with could be demonic? Because we knew that we saw demons outside in our home. Like that we knew. We knew that's what they were. There was no doubt. We're like we never thought, oh, that's ghost or we, we knew it was demonic. Right. But we never like the inward, what was inside attached to me that was on flesh, my mind, my will, my emotions. And one time he said, do you think that maybe that's demons? And he says, I growled at him. And like, I don't even remember it. Oh, wow. That's intense. But also in my life, everybody's life doesn't look like mine because I gave them so much leeway. And if you give them an inch, they're going to take a mile. 
I let them talk through me. I let them write through me. I gave them access because I thought they were part of me. I accepted them as part of me. I was protective of them. Like, don't you dare talk bad about those parts of me. They're me. And so because of that, they had a lot of leeway in my life. It doesn't always look like that for everybody. Right. Actually, I have a question about that. You said something earlier, something along the lines, uh, you studied uh, psychology in that medical field that they were, uh, what they taught to treat this was to embrace it and kind of do what you were just saying, allow them to coexist with you and let them live through you and become one with them. Man, like that, I can't help but just think that that sounds kind of satanic. Yeah, yeah. And this that's the hard part that because I was so medically minded. Right. Because, okay, in the church, it was such a taboo subject to talk about mental illness, period. And so there's two branches of thought, and, and one is way on one side and one on the other side. You have some of your churches that say it's all demonic, and then way on the other side, you have churches that say, oh, it's all, sci- it's all science, it's all chemical imbalances, and there's no balance. Because I had experienced some of the far extreme of, well, just pray about it. I was very much, no, it's scientific. If you have heart disease, you're not going to tell somebody, oh, just go pray and don't take a pill. Absolutely, you're going to go take medication. So because I was so that way, I bought hook, line, and sinker into it, and it made so much sense. Well, yeah, we just got to learn how to coexist. Like if you have a house full of roommates, you have to learn how to get together and how to compromise and and how to get along. And it was the same way. You got to learn how to get along. But absolutely demonic. Absolutely. So I have a a Christian therapist telling me to get along with them. And they're demons, and I'm giving them control to my life. This was even a Christian therapist telling you this? Yes. Oh, yeah. I didn't see secular therapist. Wow. That's kind of a, I don't know, that's crazy to me. Because it just seems kind of counterintuitive to the solution. I can understand it as like a, if that's something you have to live with, and you're trying to get cope through day-to-day life. At the same time, that's kind of saying you, you, you are stuck with this. There's nothing that you or God can do about this, so just embrace it. The diagnosis for DID in the secular world, well, even some of the Christian world, when you're looking at it scientifically, there is no cure. You do have to live with it for the rest of your life. Right. And so that's what they teach you to, co- that's why they teach you to coexist. Um, completely, completely anti, yeah. And they're not looking at it as anything bad. They're looking at it as those are parts of you that splintered because of trauma and you're just trying to give honor to them because it's part of you. So why wouldn't you honor and love all parts of you? So you're trying to love these demons. That's like, that's what you're like. You're trying to love them. And it's not ever, ever brought up that it could be anything other than parts of you. And I never, I never considered that. I never considered until my late thirties and I got diagnosed in my mid twenties. I never once considered that it was anything but parts of me. I knew their name. I knew their personalities. When each one was around, I knew who it was based on their personality. They talked different. They acted different. My eyes changed colors depending on, I would say my mood, but it wasn't my mood. It was whoever was present. And I never once thought that's a demon. And I was never taught that's a demon. And my therapist never, I don't think she knew. And I don't think she would even accepted that. If I said that to her, I think she would have labeled that mental illness. Wow. Yeah, that's intense. I got cold chills. You just saying that just a second ago. That, that is crazy. That's a, that's a, that was some time ago. I'm assuming that that happened with the therapist. Um, I'm 45 and that happened in my mid twenties. So okay. it's been so is that still the same uh, treatment practice that they're teaching today? I think whenever I was being seen, it was more integration where you try to meld into one more. I mean, it is co- coexistence, but kind of more um, where you're trying to learn. Eh. I think now it's more accept each one and cohabitate. I think the word they use now is cohabitate and cooperation versus integration. Integration is becoming one. Cohabitation is expect accepting each one for itself and letting it cohabitate. I ran, I recently ran into someone who wanted me to share my testimony on their platform. You know, I've been posting in the the groups to share my testimony yeah. and they themselves come from a background of DID disassociative identity disorder. And that's what their platform is all about. And so they were telling me that now the treatment is um, co I think it's cohabitation is what they call it. I've not been in the, the mental health field for a long time. And so I'm not sure what the, 
the treatment is, but this person was um, very triggered by my testimony and we ended up not doing it because they did not want me to say that the altars were demons oh. and they, they didn't want that talked about. And I can't give my testimony and not say that part. And that's doing a disservice to the DID community because it was 100% demonic. Yeah. And, I, I, you know, I'm not going to not say that, but they were triggered by it. And they were telling me that, well, it's not integration anymore. It's cohabitation. Well, yeah, see, I, <clears throat> that's fascinating. I find that very interesting. The coexistence between the secular world and this world. And, yeah. uh, just the far, the vastly different ways that they uh, they view these things and treat these things and uh, and handle them. It's just, it's wild. And I think the problem is when that goes into the church and that's what's accepted in the church because now you have Christians. Like I have more Christians that tell me that this isn't real or it's not possible than I do people in the world because people in the world, a lot of them are used to new age. They're used to magic. They're used to, they're used to dealing somewhat with the spiritual realm. They're easier to convince. Well, I don't even want to use the word convince. I don't try to convince anybody. That's not my job, but I get more backlash from the church than I ever do the world. Wow. I did I didn't even consider that, but, uh, you saying that that makes a lot of sense. Unfortunately, it makes perfect sense. Wow. I just wanted to uh, say just a couple things real quick, if you don't mind. No, go ahead. Thank you for coming and doing this, first of all. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for being so open and candid and just exactly what you're doing. It's perfect. And it's beautiful and it's inspiring and uh, it's touched me and I know it's going to touch other people. And I'm, I'm really thankful for that. Amen. Well, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Oh, yes, absolutely. I'd like to have you back on sometime. Sure. Anytime. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. And I just wanted to, I know you don't need my, uh, my sympathy or my apologies, but like, I'm sorry for what happened to you when you were younger. I truly am like from the heart, but at the same time, and I hope you don't take this the wrong way. Cause I thank God, I thank God that it happened. And I thank God for what's happened in, in my life, the bad things, because that's exactly what it took to get us right here and now. I don't think either one of us would be doing a podcast helping people if those things didn't happen. So I'm, I'm thankful to God for those things, truly. Mm -hmm. And I think that's he the takes, most beautiful part. He takes the ashes and turns it into beauty. Yeah, he really does. Thank you for doing what you're doing, truly. Absolutely. It's, it's amazing. And um, real quick, uh, you made mention you have a few books out there. Where can people buy those? I, I just bought a copy of one of them. So uh, I don't have it on hand or I'd show it. They're all on Amazon, just under my name, Nicole Henson on Amazon. You can find all of them. Cool. So Nicole Henson, Fullness of Joy Ministry and on Amazon, on Facebook, YouTube. Look her up. She's doing some really important work. All right. Well, Nicole, thank you so much. Thank you. I had fun. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed the interview. It's truly inspiring and just so powerful. We are so thankful to Mrs. Henson to have joined us and blessed us all with her testimony. Be sure to visit her ministry's Facebook page. Into the Facebook search bar, just type in Fullness of Joy Ministry, or just find the link that I'm going to leave in the description down below. She has tons more content for you to consume on her YouTube channel. You can find her at youtube.com slash at Cole Henson 9579. That link will also be in the description. Nicole currently has three books she has published to date. Breaking Out of Darkness, How I Was Set Free from Depression, PTSD, and Disassociative Identity Disorder, What a Mouthful, Deliverance and Spiritual Warfare Training, Breaking Free from Demonic Strongholds, and Self-Deliverance, Practical Steps to Casting Out Demons and Walking in Freedom. Plus, she has a companion workbook to go right along with the Guide to Self-Deliverance, all available for your purchase on Amazon right now. I'll drop the links to each one down below. And I've got to tell you, personally, I've recently purchased two of her books now. Totally worth it. I would refer this to anyone, really, but definitely to anyone who thinks there may be even the slightest possibility that something like this is what is going on in your life or the life of a loved one. You will find real help within these pages. I mean, real, practical, and biblical steps to take to recognize, understand, and ultimately overcome the darkness that lurks around all of us at all times within these unseen realms. If you or a loved one is currently struggling with the demonic and the unseen and you need help right now, even just to talk, don't hesitate. Well, hold that thought. If you are feeling suicidal, 
or you're having serious thoughts of harming yourself or others, and you are in a possible life-threatening situation, cut this off and pick up the phone and call the 1-800-SUICIDE hotline and or 911 right now. Seriously, get some professional help immediately and be sure not to forget to call on God too. But other than that, please do not hesitate to reach out to the show or to myself personally. And I'm sorry for speaking for you, Nicole, but I'm pretty sure that she would say the same thing. Uh, But you can reach out to her as well, or reach out to me, and I will arrange a meeting with her if necessary. This is very, very serious business. This is not a joke. This is very serious. And this is nothing to put off. This is nothing to ignore. This is nothing to try to explain away. And this is nothing that you have to try to deal with on your own. Because not any one of us is any match for this. It can seem very scary and intimidating. You could also feel very alone and trapped. Feel like you can't talk to anyone about this or you don't even know how to begin to. Just reach out to us and we will do all that we can to help you in any way that we possibly can. Or at least lead you in the direction of someone who can help. Remember above all else, we will help lead you to the answer of all. And that direction is straight ahead. Straight ahead and the path is narrow. And oftentimes it's difficult to navigate the terrain because honestly there are few who travel this path. But down this road, you will find true healing, understanding, forgiveness, love, and life. He is the great physician. He is the healer of all. And of course, I'm talking about our Lord and our Savior and our God, Jesus Christ. He is greater than he who is in the world. Through Jesus, you can overcome this. God bless you. Hey guys, if you have a testimony that you'd like to share on the show and share with the world, we are still actively accepting and reviewing all applications and requests. Just DM me on Facebook, either personally or through the podcast, or use the show's email address, which is paul.whatthehelltv at gmail.com. That'll be available in the description if you need it. Just reach out, just let us know that you're interested, and we'll be in contact with you as soon as possible. Please be sure, as always, to like, comment, to subscribe, and to share. Share, share, subscribe, 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 like, 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 comment, comment, comment. Every little thing helps. It truly does, and people need to see this. People need to hear this testimony. If you hold or gain any value from what we do, You can show your appreciation by becoming a regular monthly supporter for just the price of one cup of coffee per month. And you can do that at patreon.com slash what the hell underscore podcast. Or you can give a one-time gift by going to gofundme.com slash what the hell podcast. We are able to do all that we do and have the potential to do more and more all the time and are able to give away all of our hard work for free thanks to the kindness of supporters like you. So thank you. All those links, all in the description. I'm Paul. This is What the Hell Podcast, and I will talk to you next time.